My name is Taylor Ames. I am the Vice President of Product Strategies for Alps. Um, basically what my job is, is a, is a combination of sales, marketing, and research. Kind of, kind of help come up with ideas behind our exchange traded funds, closed end funds, open end funds, for sales guys to use out in the field. Uh, a quick word about Alps before we kind of get into my prepared remarks here. What Alps is in the business of is kind of helping to bring about innovation through factor investing, thematic investing, and then alternative assets. We're kind of product agnostic. We think when we work with best in, in class managers, index partners, whoever, through exchange traded funds, open end funds, closed end funds, we really don't care. Whatever your best idea is, that's what we want. And we're really, really excited to be able to partner with some of, of the best in breed within the industry. So before I start, I, I think it's kind of important to, to back up and, and think about why we're all here. When it comes to managing people's money or investing people's money, that is a very, very serious business. When people take their time, their talents, and their treasures, and they trust us to invest that for them, it's a very serious business. But it's also very, very rewarding and very, very fun to be a part of. And I think when you remove the compliance and the travel and the politics and all of that, to be in an industry where you can take people's money, watch it grow over time, that's so much fun to be a part of. Um, I, I got involved in, in investing when I was eight years old. I had a paper route. My mother took us to our financial advisor and he basically explained to me what stocks and bonds were. He basically started by saying, how would you like to be an owner of McDonald's? I'm like, I'm eight years old. Of course I'd want to be an owner of McDonald's. That is incredible. I invested my, my paper out money when I was eight years old um, and actually watched it grow over time and I used it to, to buy my wife's engagement ring, right? That is what we are in the business of, is taking an eight-year-old's paper out money, investing it over time, whatever the structure is, whether it's thematic or factor or whatever it is, and for them to be able to buy something of worth, to be able to buy something of value. Now, I ended up like selling my McDonald's stock to buy my wife's engagement ring. I had some money left over and I bought Bank of America in October of 2007. Didn't turn out very well as a result of that. So I think that that's also gives kind of some credence to invest in people who kind of know what they're doing. Don't just try to beat the market thinking that you're a 20 year old who knows that Bank of America is probably not gonna do well over the next couple of years. So when it comes to investing and really the future of investing, the future is always changing but we're really at a, at a tipping point right now, at an inflection point, right? There's so much that is happening within the world of technology that is changing the way that we within the financial industry interact and do business, right? It used to be that you would need to invest your money through a financial advisor or a stockbroker. He was the only one that could buy stocks for you. Now, they, they were talking about it on the panel, robos can do all of that for you. You don't need a financial advisor. They, they still have a place and they're still absolutely essential to the industry, but there are other options that are out there because of technology. You also have to think about the millennials, right? And I am, I am key millennial. What I always say is, guys, hold on, I, I got to get a selfie of this. I'm a millennial. If I don't take a selfie, it, it didn't really happen, okay? I actually wanted to say the damn millennials in this presentation. I asked our compliance person if I could, and they're like, no, you're basically degrading an entire generation. The millennials don't think about the importance of size and style investing and sector diversification and things like that. They're still essential. They're still really important. But when it comes to things like thematic investing in, in environmental, social, and governmental investing, these are the things that the next generation cares about. There was a study that, that was done uh, last year and basically about 30% of the general population cares about thematic investing. That's a good percentage, but when it comes to the damn millennials, sorry about you, but like we're at 83%, okay? We probably don't even know what size and style investing is. That's why we need financial advisors. But when you think about the proliferation of, of smart beta, of factor investing, that's all very important. At the same time, we have to be aware of the fact that the next generation cares about investing across multiple countries at the same time, multiple market capitalizations at the same time, multiple market cap, uh, multiple sectors at the same time. They want to invest in the things that they care about, right? So with that, we've really seen kind of this, this rebirth of thematic investing. It's always been around, nothing new under the sun, but you're starting to see people talk about it 
a lot more. This panel, I, I have little tallies, mentioned the word thematic 13 times in the last panel. Probably a year ago, it would have been like three, four, five, somewhere in there. Because of the changes in technology, in an aging demographic, in the millennials, in infrastructure in China, things that are changing the way that we as consumers behave and interact, Thematic investing is becoming more and more popular, and, and like factor investing, like closed-end funds, it's, it's here to stay. It's not really going to go anywhere. So when it comes to thematic investing, it, it, it's like anything. You have to do your due diligence. You have to know what you want to invest in. You have to know what your conviction is, and then you have to be able to identify those companies. When it comes to the, the world of, of themes, or, or really, disruptive technologies, things that are changing the way that we as consumers behave and interact, there's really kind of five stages to think about, okay? The first one is kind of the, the testing stage and the innovation stage. Someone has an idea, they think it's a, a pretty awesome idea, and they're trying to get people to buy into it. The, the example that we're looking at right now is the world of blockchain, right? We all kind of get it. It's super fun to talk about at cocktail parties, but like we don't necessarily really get it. But you get companies that are like iced tea companies becoming blockchain companies and growing 250% overnight, right? That's the innovation stage. You can certainly invest in it, but obviously it's going to be really, really high risk. After that, you kind of have that early adoption stage of disruptive technology. This is where people are like, okay. I understand blockchain. When it comes up at a cocktail party, I'm like, hey, I'm the guy who knows about it. I'm the guy who knows about blockchain. Come and ask me. Blockchain is not there. What you'd have to think about where we are now would be like 4K television. We all kind of know that it's out there. Like we've seen it at a friend's house. We're like, that picture is amazing. But we might not necessarily own it ourselves. Becoming a lot more popular. We think that it's here to stay. It's poised for kind of some explosive growth. After that, you have kind of the, the early majority, where we're like, okay, I understand blockchain. I own a 4K television. Everyone's going to get this eventually. I want to be the first to own it, right? That would be like your, your wireless headphones, right? Everyone knows you can cut the cord on your headphones. They're really, really annoying. And as long as you don't lose those tiny little earbuds, you're going to be fine. Then after that, you get kind of the late majority. Those are the people who are like, okay, I get this, I get blockchain, I own the 4K television, I'm listening to my Beats by Dre on my wireless headphones. Now I need, to, I need to tweet about it. I need to post it on the social medias, right? Social media is where the late adopters are. When my father gets an Instagram account, you know that it's probably run its course and it's, it's probably not a whole lot more room for explosive growth. When I tell my dad what, like, what a hashtag is and I do this, it's like, are you flashing gang signs? Like, nah, dad, like, sorry, wrong, wrong generation, okay? The final one in there is, is the laggards. And that would be where everybody and their mother owns, they understand blockchain, they own the 4K television, they have their Beach by Dre as they're live tweeting about stuff, but they're doing it on their iPhone, right? The market has been completely penetrated, completely saturated. My mother finally realizes that if she has a flat tire, she needs to be able to call somebody on her phone. When it comes to disruptive technology, when it comes to thematic investing, you have to think about what you want to be investing in. At what stage of that cycle do you want to be investing in? There's obviously risk and reward with all of those cycles. You also have to think along that kind of that, that S curve, um, how many companies are involved in that? How many companies are publicly traded? How many publicly traded blockchain companies are there? Probably not a whole lot that have a majority of their revenue being derived from that specific disruptive technology. Do you want to own a company that just has kind of like a, a little part of their business invest in one of these disruptive technologies and one of these themes? Or do you want to go with something a little bit more specific? These are just questions that you need to be asking yourself. What is my exposure in terms of countries? Do I really want to be owning a portfolio that's 40, 50% China? Do I want to be owning a portfolio that's 80, 90% the United States? I don't know. That's up to everybody's investment decisions, right? But these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves, just like we're asking ourselves when we're, when we're evaluating any sort of portfolio. When you kind of think about the ways that you can build up a portfolio with disruptive technology, with themes, we kind of think that, that you create a box. There's something that you can do where you invest across one specific theme, uh, blockchain, um, robotics, AI, something like that. But you just want broad exposure. So you might have to invest in 100, 200 companies within that 
particular theme. You'll get access to the theme. Do you have a pure play? I, I, I don't know, right? Or you can say, hey, I want to do a more of a pure play where I want to invest in one single theme, blockchain, robotics, uh, wearable, uh, wearable fitness, things like that. But I only want a couple companies. I just want the companies that derive a majority of their revenue through um, that specific technology. What you can run into there is you're, you're very, very concentrated, which poses its own risks. We think that when possible, if you can invest in those companies that derive a majority of their revenue from a specific theme or from a specific technology, you're getting the exposure that you want. But then at the same time, you, you got to diversify. You need to be able to invest across multiple different themes at the same time, across multiple different technologies at the same time, because that's how you build an effective portfolio, right? So what we've done is, is at Alps, we've kind of identified what we believe to be about 10 different disruptive themes that exist within the investment world. You guys probably can't read it. I'm sitting right here and I can barely read it and I'm wearing glasses and my eyesight is still good because I'm only, I'm not going to tell you guys how old I am. But we believe that things like robotics and AI, things like financial technology, things like clean and green investing, these are the technologies that are changing the future. These are the technologies that are changing the way that we as humans interact with one another. Now at the same time, we're well aware that there are other technologies that are out there, right? Blockchain is, is not on here. Medicinal marijuana or uh, what does what one ETF provider call it? Alternative harvest. I don't necessarily know if that's a technology, but being in Colorado, it's, it's a booming industry. That's where Alps is based out of. We know that this is not an exhaustive list, but we think that these are kind of some of the, the technologies that, that are changing the way that we interact. At the same time, what we need to be aware of is that not all of these technologies, not all of these companies are going to make it, right? Think about MySpace and think about Facebook, okay? MySpace had the first mover advantage over Facebook. When you're bringing something out that is a completely new technology that, that's connecting so many different people, having that first mover advantage is incredible. Does anyone remember MySpace? Does anyone still own a MySpace account? I don't even think you can open a MySpace account if you wanted to, right? It's all Facebook all the time. I remember when I was an awkward middle schooler, my entire night was sitting on AOL Instant Messenger. And it was like, hey, is, is my crush gonna come on? Like, I think she normally comes on at like 7.30, and oh my gosh, if she came on, I, it, I just, I lost my mind, okay? That was a disruptive technology that, that changed the world, but it's no longer there. So you have to be aware that not all of these technologies are gonna be around and are gonna exist. They're not necessarily gonna exist a decade from now. I think that there's a really, really perfect example to describe what could potentially happen or potentially not happen within the world of thematic investing, okay? It revolves, involves robotics and artificial intelligence. We all know that this is the wave of the future, right? We all know that it creates efficiencies, lowers prices, things like that, okay? Let's, think of, let's go down a, the road of a thought experiment together, okay? There is something called Roko's Basilisk, all right? Roko's Basilisk is a take on uh, this, this decision theory and thought experiment based off of Pascal's wager. Stay with me. Pascal's wager basically says you need to go out and search for kryptonite on the off chance that Superman exists and Superman wants to come and kill you, okay? That's, that's Pascal's wager, okay? Roko's Basilisk basically says that in the future, there is an all-powerful, sentient, artificial intelligence that will go about retroactively punishing those who did not bring about its existence. And merely the fact that I have described Roko's Basilisk to all of you, and the fact that you may or may not do anything about bringing about the existence of artificial intelligence, I've just doomed all of us, okay? So, you're welcome, all right? If you have an all-powerful, sentient being that comes about to destroy humanity, probably not gonna be great for stock prices, right? I don't think that the robots are gonna need stocks to invest in, but 
you're probably going to see a couple companies miss their earnings reports when you hear about all, all powerful beings coming in to enslave the race of humanity. All that being said, we don't know which technologies are going to make it. Some are promising, some are kind of weird, some are going to make it, some aren't. So I apologize for dooming and enslaving all of us to the race of the future super beings, but hey, at least we're all in this together, right? So with all of that being said, here's what, what we at Alps do. We uh, do a bunch of different thematic ETFs. We do some, sp some ETFs in the biotech space and the gold miner space and junior gold miners. So this is something that, that we're pretty knowledgeable about. We think that you can invest across multiple different disruptive technologies. So we identified 10 because I'm not super good at math and if we would have identified 11, then you're having like rounding numbers and things like that. No good for anybody. We don't need to round numbers. Okay, so we identified 10 different disruptive technologies. But then based off of that, we found 10 companies that derive the majority of their revenue from that specific disruptive technology, from healthcare innovation, from clean and green, from the internet of things, from financial technology, data and analytics, and I think there's, there's four more. We understand that, not all of the, that some of these disruptive technologies will go away and we'll make the adjustment as we need to when we kind of do our, our index um, reconstruction. We do that every few years. And we also know that some of them will be successful and will no longer be disruptive. I wouldn't say that Facebook is necessarily doing anything disruptive anymore, so that's why they don't fit in a portfolio like this. The other nice thing to think about is that when it comes to these different technologies, they, they don't exist in a vacuum. You don't see one just kind of take off and beat the rest of them, right? Healthcare tends to work well with data and analytics. The more data that we have, the more healthy we may end up being. Financial technology uses a lot of data, data and analytics, right? Cloud computing will have a lot to do with the internet of things. So we don't believe that any of this exists within a vacuum, that when you kind of combine all of these together, you kind of create a, a really, really well-rounded ETF. The other thing is it's kind of like you're investing in sectors or kind of like your size in style boxes. There are gonna be different technologies that do really well on certain, over certain time periods and others that don't. And if you get exposure to all of them, that's how you build up a diversified ETF. I think that the healthcare portion of something like DTEC, and DTEC is up about 10%-ish year to date. What I found over the years is if I say ish and do this with my hands, compliance is totally fine with spouting out whatever number I want to. So DTEC is up about 10%-ish this year, and the market's basically flat. The healthcare component of this is up about 25% this year. Whereas like the robotics and AI, people are starting to kind of catch on to Roko's Basilisk. It's actually down about three or 4% per year. So when you can invest across these multiple different technologies, you're able to kind of build out a really good thematic portfolio that will behave pretty well in, in, in different market environments. When it comes to, it's interesting, with the proliferation and growth of exchange traded funds, we're kind of at this stage where we're like, hey, we're here, we're, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. The next question is, okay, how does this fit? Where do I put themes? Where do I put thematic investing within a portfolio, right? What we would say, you know, the people that have CFAs and CFPs, you'd be like, oh, okay, I got it. This is the, the alpha driver in the growth portion of your portfolio. And all of us are like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Try telling that to the group of uh, wellness students that I just went to talk to about finance at the University of Denver. The second you say alpha, like their eyes just, just glaze over, okay? So you have to be able to think about how you position this for the next generation of investors. Our generation, we all understand that this is something that serves as an alpha portion of a core or a growth portfolio, okay? But when it comes to the next generation, what you have to remember is that they want to invest in the things that they have conviction about. I, I was talking to this wellness class about price to earnings ratios and beating earnings reports and things like that and what makes for profitable companies. And, and one of the smarter students in the room raised their hand and said, well, what about how, how they're doing with giving back to the community and lowering their economic footprint? And, and we laugh because we're like, I told them one of the best white papers I ever read about clean and green investing was titled, you want to, be, want to invest in clean and green? Plant a tree. Not sustainable. Now that's, that's changed. 
But what we all have to recognize is that this is the future. This is the future of investing. You have to be able to talk to people about investing with conviction, investing in the things that you understand, investing in the things that you care about, the things that you value about. The millennial generation, the thing that they care about most when they, when they invest is caring about the things that they value. So if you can use thematic investing to describe to people how they can invest in the things that they care about, we as kind of the portfolio builders who want to talk about the alpha driver of a growth sieve, we get it. But then we can also talk to those damn millennials. Again, I'm really, really sorry about us. We don't make eye contact. We don't listen, we don't listen to voicemails, any of that. Sorry about you. So it's just something to think about. I think that we can all recognize that technology is changing the way that we interact, the way that we behave, and it's not going anywhere. The speed at which information comes about, the speed at which information is digested and replicated in terms of the stock market, that's, that's only going to increase, all right? We also need to understand that thematic investing, it's always been around, but now is a really, really good opportunity for us to start talking about it, thinking about it, doing our due diligence again. And then when it comes to doing thematic investing, investing in things like disruptive technologies, it really makes sense to invest across a broad basket of it and invest in those companies that are actually exposed to those technologies. That's what we're doing at Alps. We think that you know, we're all in a very, very interesting time. We're at an inflection point within our industry, and our industry goes through a lot of inflection points. But to be a part of it and to be able to, to offer products and to be able to, to talk to people like yourselves who kind of understand this and we, we all want to push each other to, to kind of get better, it's, uh, it's a really interesting and, and honestly fun time to be a part of. So with that, I, I have a couple minutes if there are any questions. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Medical marijuana, does it go, in, it's go into health, your health care sector or is it too soon? Or why? This is what, yeah, this is the interesting thing when you bring up medical marijuana. It, it depends. I don't necessarily think that I would list medicinal marijuana as its own disruptive technology, but it could fall under the healthcare industry. Listen, I hope we're not being recorded. As soon as recreational marijuana is approved, and we all know eventually it will be. Do you think that the little dispensaries within Denver and the state of Colorado are going to be the global leaders in production? Absolutely not, right? Anheuser-Busch, Philip Morris, they're all ready to go. So it will have its place, but it might get snatched up pretty quickly. But it's, it's definitely something specifically where, where we're based out of that is very well regulated, very professional, very good business models. It's, it's something to definitely keep your eye on. Anything? Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you re-examine those 10 technologies. You, I think you, your words were every few years. I know that you only have a quarter under your belt, but can you quantify that every few years? Yeah, re -examine? It's, it's every three. We're kind of getting into, into the weeds a little bit, but we will look at, at those disruptive technologies every three years and determine whether or not we think that they'll continue to run and continue to be within the portfolio or the index, excuse me, or not. The thought being on why we give it such a long time frame is because of that S-curve. You need to allow a technology to go from innovation to early adoption to early majority to late majority to laggard or die out. But that does take about, it, it takes some time. That math checks out, yes. <laughs> Correct. Question back there? Can we ask about uh, other products that you guys have? No, yes. <laughs> um, you've had that uh, gold miner junior uh, one for a while, and the big competitor there, Vernex, uh, basically broke the model, and yet yours has not grown. And for someone who invests in uh, ETFs, you know, we need liquidity and size. I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are, why you, you can't grow that one. So you're basically telling me we're not doing a good job. No, no. The way that we, the, the question was, we, we have a couple gold miners products. Um, how do they, how do people use them and, and why aren't we seeing some of the growth that some of the others are getting? Uh, we didn't have first mover advantage on that and that, that certainly plays in. The way that we're seeing a lot of people using 
this particular thematic ETF, and people will use a lot of different thematic ETFs this way, is simply as, as short-term trading vehicles, as figuring out various entry and exit points based off of technical indicators, relative strength, whatever it is. So we see the volume being uh, very, very high and people trading in and out of it uh, often and, and with, with a lot of um, velocity, but we just don't think that a, a lot of people use that particular product as a long-term holding. We'd love to change it, but if they're, using, if they're using us and using it and we're seeing volume tick up in it, we're happy about that as well. Yes, up front. How do you intend to grow your assets under management? Some other panelists were saying, how do you intend to grow your assets under management? Some of the other panelists were saying you have to get to at least $100 million right now. So other than hand-waving and hoping people will discover it, how specifically do you really plan to grow? Whew, that's a really, really good question. Let's just talk about the Alps business model as a whole. All right, I can take, I can take a stab at that. Yes, a lot of firms have certain thresholds that you have to, that you have to achieve before you are available on their platforms. And once you hit those, you kind of hit this inflection point and you see assets grow. When you have newer ETFs like DTEC, and it's one of the fastest growing ETFs this year, but its assets are still relatively small, you have to go to different channels. You have to look at the, at the independent route or the RAA route, where those organizations don't have the same barriers to entry that wirehouses might. Um, so that's kind of how we're starting in terms of how we sell a product like this. But then other than that, it, it's like any other kind of fledgling exchange traded fund or mutual fund provider. You, you have to understand who you are, what your foundation is, what your vision is, where you fit in with all of the other players that exist within the marketplace. For Alps, we want to be part of kind of your, your satellite. We want to be that um, portfolio completion mechanism where if you want a specific factor or you want a specific theme or you want some sort of alternative asset like uh, listed private equity or global long short or things like that, that's where we want to exist. So it's important to get that message out to get people to understand who you are and then to be able to talk to people that have ready, uh, are able to adopt your products very readily. So I got 30 seconds. Am I going to get extra credit because I finished early? I would love that. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Enjoy lunch. <laughs>